Is there any reason you didn't hold this to the comments from Matthew? Right? <laughs> 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 a little more expensive. We <laughs> <laughs> could have had a bigger crowd, right? <laughs> you probably don't know what that is, right? I have no idea. It's right, a major huge stadium <laughs> for MLB. <laughs> that would have been nice. But. <laughs> My I'm going to start on time, which I hardly ever do, just because we're about full here. Anyway, people can wander in as they want. So I'm going to dive right into it. Oh, what I usually do these days is a uh, fairly short monologue to start with, and then I like to get into back and forth. Um, because if I was just going to preach at you, you could just watch a YouTube video. Uh, the more interesting, useful thing is when we can have back and forth and people can ask stuff and, and throw the discussion in whatever direction they want. Um, but I usually start with a fairly short monologue so people get the general gist of what I'm saying and so we don't have to discuss and debate the terminology of what we're even talking about. So I'm just going to dive in. A guy shows up at your front door and he says, Hey, I'm new in town and can I have a few minutes here of your day so I can tell you about some services I provide. And you say, uh, I'm kind of busy. And he says, it'll only take a few minutes and I promise you that when I'm done, you will be sure that you simply cannot live without the services I provide. And you say, all right, this is going to be a waste of time, but what services do you provide? And he says, well, we decide on a case-by-case -case basis what services we think you need. Now, maybe it's we give you food, maybe it's we help you with housing, maybe it's we help your neighbor, maybe it's we help protect you, but we decide what services you need. And you're already kind of suspicious, like, why would I, why would I let you decide which, what services I need? And you say, well, this sounds kind of fishy, well, how much does this cost? And he says, well, we decide as we go along on a regular basis how much we're going to charge you for it, and the, 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 the price may fluctuate here and there. And you say, okay, I, I don't think I'm interested. Uh, it sounds too vague. I can't even tell what you're going to do for me or what it's going to cost me, so no thanks. He says, okay, maybe I wasn't clear. You don't, we don't ask your permission exactly. You have to pay us the price that we say it's going to cost you for the services that we're going to decide to provide you. And you say, what do you mean I have to? You just, I don't, I don't have to pay your services. Well, th there will be adverse consequences if you don't. Would you just mean my life won't be as good if I don't hire you? Or, or, or are you threatening me? Well, I, I don't call it a threat. <laughs> See, if we don't all work together for the common good, you know, things don't work as well. So we can't let people not pull their weight and not do their fair share of making this system work together. He said, wait, you're talking all this vague garbage. What are you going to do to me if I don't pay for your services? Well, let's not get into that. You just, if you pay, everything will be perfectly fine. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying things would be okay if you don't pay, but just, just pay and go along and everything will be just fine. And you say, all right, kind of sounds like you're threatening me and it's time for you to leave. So you slam the door in his face. He comes back the next day, and he says, I, I think you were right. It was, it was rude of me to just say, you have to pay for my services. And, but now you're really in charge. Now we will serve you. And you say, okay, good. So now I get to decide what services you provide? Well, no. We will still decide what services we provide. Well, I decide the price I'm going to pay? No, we decide the price, and you still have to pay it. Well, that's the same as before. In what way am I in charge? Well, you see, each month, I and my cousin Bubba will show up here at your front door, and you can choose which one of us is going to decide what services you need and how much it will cost for that month. Now, if you don't like the way it goes that month, next month we will come back, and you can choose the other one who will decide what services we provide and how much it will cost you. So that really means that you're in charge. You're our boss because you get to choose between the two. Well, what if I choose neither? What if I don't like either of your services? You're not even telling me what the services are. You say what it might be. Like, 
do you guarantee that you're going to feed me? Well, no, we don't guarantee that. Do you guarantee that you're going to protect me from, from other people? No, we don't guarantee that. Do you guarantee that you're not going to do things I don't even like? You know, never mind not doing what I want. Might you do things I, I'm morally opposed to? Well, yeah, we might. But you don't really have a choice. Again, everyone has to work together for the common good for this to work. And, and you say, this, I'm still not in charge. Giving me a choice between two people robbing me. Oh, come on, don't call it robbing you. We're serving you. We're representing you. In fact, we are you. Because we're all in this together. And we're all going to be one big happy family. And if you just go along and, and pay what we say and we perform the services and and you say, no, you're still threatening me, slam the door in your face. And he comes back the next day and says, I don't think you all the way understood the situation. Maybe, maybe you're not clear on how this works. We're serving you. We're representing you. You are the customers. And you're the boss. And we do what you want. And if you don't go along with this, you're the bad guy for messing up the situation. We were all set to uphold our end of the bargain. And by living in this neighborhood, you agreed to go along with this because the other people go along with it because if they don't, there are adverse consequences to them. So you're the one causing trouble. I mean, we've been to all your neighbors' houses and told them, here's the way it is, and most of them have decided when they heard what the consequences were that they're going along with it. So when you don't go along with it, you're the problem here. You're the one not pulling your weight. You're the one messing up our society by objecting to this and trying to get out of your responsibility to participate in this great system. And you say, you're insane, please leave. And you slam the door in his face. Here's the point. If that happened, if that guy showed up at anybody's door, just about everybody in the country would not only recognize that what he was saying was criminal, but downright insane. For someone to tell you, I'm going to decide what services you need, I'm going to decide the price, and you don't have a choice whether to support it, whether to pay for it, whether to go along with it. Now, guy comes back next week and says, okay, I understand that you don't really want to be coerced into this, you don't want to be forced to pay for it when you don't even know what the services are, but let me put it this way. Aren't there some of your neighbors that you may not like their habits, you may not like what they support, you may not like their attitude, you may not like what car they drive, uh, whatever. You can suggest to us things about your neighbor that you wish were different, and we'll see what we can do to change that. And if you're a decent human being, you say, I don't want you terrorizing, you sound like the mafia, I don't want you terrorizing my neighbors, leave my neighbors alone. Even the ones I don't particularly like. Leave them alone, too. He says, well, are you sure? I mean, we don't like to do it too directly, but we could kind of take some of their money and get you something nice. Wouldn't you like that? It's like, no, you're just being in the mafia. Leave them alone. Don't rob my neighbors. Even the ones that I don't particularly get along with, don't rob them either. He says, well, okay, but i got to tell you, not all of your neighbors said that. And so you're going to have to pay for some of the things that they want that you might not want, you might be morally opposed to, but you don't really have a choice because they went along with it. They asked us. We're representing them because they actually asked us to take your money to pay for things they want. So pay up. And again, you slam the door in his face. Again, the point is that in that context, everybody recognized recognizes that the guy who shows up at your door and says that is the bad guy. He is acting uncivilized. He is not playing the way decent moral human beings play. It's a threat. It's extortion. It's the mafia. Now, if everybody recognizes that in that setting, you know, the admittedly silly hypothetical example I just gave, that people chuckle at because they're so stupid because nobody's going to do that, no private person is going to come say, I will decide what services to give you and I will decide the price and I'll hurt you if you don't pay. Why is it that just about 100% of people think that's ridiculous and would say, no, that wouldn't be okay? And almost 100% of people believe the exact 
exact same lie as long as they are taught from when they're really young that this group is allowed to because they're called the United States Congress. And when they say, we decide how much you're going to pay and we decide what services to provide you and we don't guarantee you anything. We don't guarantee you food. We don't guarantee you protection. And we can change the price whenever we want. We call it tax rates. And you can come to us as often as you want and tell us what you, what you hope we will do. And we won't care. We'll do whatever we're going to do anyway. But you can come beg. You can say, can I please not quite pay you as much? And we'll say, no, you have to pay us more. And we'll call it raising tax rates. And people say, well, oh well. And if you resist and say, this is bogus. They don't have the right to do this. Your neighbors will often say, you're messing up the game. Because that guy who showed up at your front door, who's acting like the mafia, you're not playing along. I play along. When he shows up at my front door, I give him my money and, and let him boss me around and, and do whatever he says. That makes me good. It makes you bad. Now, who on earth would say that if it wasn't the government that we've been trained to recognize as a rightful authority? If it was just some guy off the street? Nobody would take pride in going along with the random guy who shows up at their door and tries to rule them. Which is why we are trained from when we're very small to imagine it's okay when a certain gang that has really big buildings and it looks really fancy and they do big rituals so it must be legitimate. And that's the only reason we accept it. It's the same reason little kids believe in Santa Claus because they heard it when they were really young and they heard it over and over again. Most kids. Some didn't. And they think, well, if everybody believes it, it's got to be true. The belief in government is provably no more rational than the belief in Santa Claus. Trouble is, all the, all the adults still believe, or most of them. But the amazing thing is that it is not that people naturally want to be dominated, or want government, or want to be robbed. They don't want that guy who shows up at the front door. They don't say, I'm so glad you're here to force things on me and to make me pay for whatever you say I need and not even give me a choice and threaten to hurt me if I don't pay for whatever you decide to do at whatever price you decide to do it. Normal people would never go along with that. And there's a reason for that. Normal people are anarchists. Until they are trained to imagine that a certain guy, if he shows up at your door and says, I'm with the IRS. He doesn't just say, I'm with some business. I'm with the IRS, or I'm with the FBI, or I'm with the police. State, federal, local, it doesn't matter. We are trained to believe that certain gangs, it's okay if they do this utterly insane, immoral thing. But if your neighbor did the same thing, made the same deals and the same threats, nobody would accept it as legitimate. Now, the title of this talk is Government is Not Your Friend. And some people will assume it's, well, government does corrupt things and it does bad things. That's not at all my point. That guy who shows up at your front door, even if he does something nice to you, he, he brings you a sandwich after he demands money from you and, and threatens you, that doesn't make the arrangement okay. That guy will never be your friend. And that guy is never going to show up to your front door with your best interests at heart. I mean, how... How much more obvious could that be? If somebody comes up to you that you don't know and says, I want permission to control your life and take your money and interfere with your interactions with other human beings, do you really believe that this stranger is doing it because he wants what's best for you? Of course not. And nobody would think otherwise if it was just some guy in the street. But we're trained to imagine, or at least delusionally hope, that the people in government are controlling us and stealing our money for our benefit. But it's utterly insane. And when people say, well, if we elect, that guy sounds so sincere, and if we elect the right person, he really sounds like he cares. If somebody cares about you, they will not try to violently control you. I think that's pretty obvious. And we have to be trained from childhood to imagine an exception to ever think otherwise. And the funny thing is, is a lot of people will say, well, I, I'm scared of the market and free exchange because I'm not sure it will handle this right. So I want government, not the guy who shows up and says, 
here's my price for this service. You can take it or leave it. I'm not going to hurt you either way. To be scared of him, but not to be scared of the guy who says, I'll decide what service is and I'll decide the price and you have to take it or I hurt you. To think that that guy has your interests at heart more than the other guy is just loony. But the trick they use to make anybody buy it is they say, well, how about if we use it on other people? Like, I know you're not going to come to me and say, please boss me around. Who would do that? But wouldn't you like it if we could control your neighbor and make him not have those habits? Yeah, he drinks a little too much. Well, we'll make it so he can't drink. He might play his music too loud, or he might have a car. He has a car that's fancier than yours and more expensive, and that's not really fair. So we'll take some of his money and give it to you, and you can get a better car, and he'll have to sell his car. And the temptation to use power to control the other guy is why 99% of people fall for the lie of government. The guy shows up at the door and wants to boss you around. People say, I don't want you to boss me around. But if they say, well, we can take your neighbor's stuff, we can boss him around, we can make him be the way you know he should be. And everybody who votes falls for that. Everybody who votes falls for that. That I'm going to vote for the guy who's going to fund what should be funded. And how does that work? Well, he's going to take the money from them. He's going to take my money, too. But hey, if it happens to be what I want to have happen, whether it's helping the poor or having a police force, whatever it is, you know darn well the guy you're voting for isn't only going to tax you, he's going to tax the other people who disagree with you. So when everybody runs to the voting booth and tries to get their guy to win, they're not pressing that button or flipping the lever hoping the other guy will win. They want their guy to win because they want their values and preferences and what they care about forced on the other guy. And the guy who shows up at your front door, that's the only reason he has any power is because it is so tempting to fall for that, for that lie that, hey, we can make the world better, we can make it what it should be if you give me the power to control them and to make them hand over money to take care of the poor, to pay for defense, or whatever you think is important. Just give me the power, and I will make your neighbor behave the way you know he ought to. And as long as people fall for that, the whole world loses, except the ruling class. And the only way we ever get out of that is when all the decent people recognize that government cannot be your friend. The guy at the front door... In that arrangement, that can never be your friend, even if he gives you stolen loot from your neighbor. Yeah, your wallet may look better because government took somebody else's money and gave it to you. That does not help society any more than you going to your neighbor and robbing him yourself, which would at least be honest. The people in government, when they are giving handouts, when they are giving, we're going to help the poor, we're going to do social security and help the retired, and we're going to do this, don't ever imagine for a moment that somebody who would force their agenda on you is doing it for your benefit. When you get a check from the government, there's one reason you're getting that. They are buying your loyalty with, with somebody else's money. And when we fall for that, we are the ones giving them power, not only over the neighbors that we want violently controlled, but over ourselves. If you and your neighbor, if that guy comes to your front door and then comes to his front door and you both say, yeah, I like this deal, but take more of his money. Tell him what to do. And your neighbor is saying the same thing about you. No, make him, make him fund the things I care about. Here's this, this charity I want him to give to, and here's this program I want him to fund. It puts us at war with each other forever. And the only way out of that is for people to recognize that that guy who shows up at your front door is the enemy of humanity. And what every decent, moral human being has to do is say, go away, I don't want you controlling me, and I don't want you controlling my neighbor. And even if my neighbor is obnoxious, I don't particularly like him, we don't get along, we hardly ever talk, if you try to rob him, even if you say it's for something I want, I'm on his side, not yours. When that happens, that is the beginning of freedom, and it is the end of government. Now the concept, the term anarchy, makes people freak out. Because a lot of people have been trained to, to mix the two meanings together. One meaning is chaos, chaos and mayhem. The other meaning is, what it actually literally means, is rule by no one. 
Anarchy is like monarchy is ruled by what? Anarchy is ruled by now. Ruled by now. It doesn't mean chaos and mayhem. It doesn't mean Molotov cocktails through windows. It means there isn't the guy at the front door bossing everybody around and forcibly controlling people's lives. And that's all it means. And it's so funny to me, well, funny and frustrating, that people have this idea in their head that anarchy means we're going to like mess up society. We're not going to be organized and we're not going to cooperate. All it means is we're not going to go along with the guy who shows up at the front door and says, I want to control everybody. You can still cooperate with your neighbor and trade stuff and organize whatever you want. Two people can organize. Two billion people can organize. The one thing you can't do is say, we have special rights. We get to force other people into our organization. We get to force other people to pay for what we care about. And that's the only thing that anarchy removes from society is the illusion that certain people have the right to initiate violence. And that's all. And it's so amazing to me that the authoritarian propaganda has convinced so many people that chaos is what's going to result from telling those people, no, you don't get to violently control us. Imagine the lunacy of the logic that we are trained to believe that telling that group of people, you don't get to violently dominate us, that is going to lead to bloodshed and mayhem. And even if you open a history book, and I love to do this with people say, oh, if there wasn't government, everything would be way worse. If we didn't accept that guy at the front door, for some reason we'd be killing and eating each other. That would just be under chaos. And I say, okay, well, let's play a game. You start citing some examples of, like, large-scale injustices and murder that resulted from a lack of authority, also known as anarchy, and I'll start listing some that resulted from authority. Every war... Uh, Mao Zedong, 42 million dead. Joseph Stalin, 20 or 30 million dead. The Nazi regime, every the Pol Pot, every authoritarian empire. And despite the fact that literally more than 200 million human beings have been murdered by their own governments, not including war, you can pile on the war statistics on top of that, people still believe that government, the thing responsible for that, is what keeps us civilized. It's utterly insane, which is why they have to start teaching it to us when we're just barely old enough to understand the words. Because if you grew up in a free society and that guy showed up at your front door, everybody would not only recognize his, his suggestions as immoral and stupid, they would think he was insane. Wouldn't you think someone was insane if he was a normal person who showed up and said, I'm going to control you, I will decide what services you get, and I'm going to make you pay for them, and I'm going to hurt you if you don't go along with it. Like, okay, you're dangerous, and you're out of your mind. Well, you have to choose between two of us. Now is it okay? Because now it's democracy. And now it's great, and that's what we have to spread around the world, the idea that if me and Bubba show up at your front door and let you decide which one of us is going to violently dominate you, that means you're in charge. That's just as good as being free. And nobody in that context would fall for that. Said, That's not the same as being free. That's choosing which robber is going to rob me. And yet, millions and millions and millions of people are genuinely, profoundly, emotionally attached to democracy because they think it equals freedom and civilization when it's the exact opposite. <coughs> and again, the beauty of the situation, you know, the horror of the situation is the mass injustice that people not only go along with, but that they vote for, thinking this is the system, this is what we need. Again, that guy at the front door who says, you won't possibly be able to live without my services. How many people really and truly believe that human society cannot live without a ruling class, without government? It's a lot of people, which means they really believe that like, we in this room could not possibly interact on a peaceful basis without that guy showing up who gets to threaten us all and steal our money. I don't see that guy here, and so far we seem to be getting along pretty well. But we're trained to imagine an exception. And that's why there's actually hope. Because in any other context, we all recognize the excuses for government as completely insane. We have to be trained when we're really young 
to see that in this case it's necessary, because they have constitutions, and they have elections, and they have those really big buildings, and they have lots of law books, and they sound so official, and you watch CNN, and they say big words, and they dress in suits, so it must be legitimate. It isn't just some loony at your front door saying you do what I say or hurt you. It looks so professional. It looks like, you know, the inauguration. It looks like the crowning of a king. There's a reason for that. Because Divine Right of Kings was a little bit too stupid to be for, for people to fall for anymore. They changed it to Divine Right of Politicians. Most people still fall for it. Because if you do big rituals, it must be real. There must be something to this. They wouldn't do all this just based on made-up powers that they just claimed to have. Well, yeah, they would, and yeah, they did. And the only reason it works is because we fall for it. But again, the beauty is that people are naturally anarchists. And that doesn't mean they throw bombs through windows. It means they want voluntary interaction. They don't want the guy showing up and saying, I'm your master, I'm going to boss you around. They want to be able to go to a supermarket and say, I, I want that and that, and I, I would have bought that, but it's a little bit too expensive, so I'll just have these. And then you go to the counter and you do a voluntary transaction. You didn't have to buy anything. They didn't have to sell you anything. You do the deal. They get a little bit of money. You get some food or whatever you bought. You go away. Thank you on the brink of death there. <laughs> and guess what? There's a word for that. It's called anarchism. The more specific term for it is voluntarism. Um, and a lot of people say you should use voluntarism and not anarchism because that word is scary. And to a certain extent I agree, except usually if you start explaining voluntarism someone will say, you mean like anarchism, no government? <laughs> so I, I'll just start with the term that freaks them out and then explain why it shouldn't freak you out to say, that guy at your front door, it's not okay that he's doing it. And really, that is all the term means. When somebody says, I get to be your rightful lord and master for your own good, all anarchism means is, I don't believe you. I don't believe you want to violently dominate me for my own good. What kind of bogus claim is that? It's like a carjacker saying, this is for your own good, can I have your car please? <laughs> Nobody would fall for that unless you do these big rituals and have massive propaganda from the time kids are tiny little kids, pledge allegiance to the flag, and to the republic, which is a ruling class, for which it stands, before they even know what the words are saying, what the words mean. And so, again, the reason that there is hope is this is not what people naturally choose. That's not the form of interaction they naturally choose. They choose voluntarism, which is, I don't want to attack my neighbor, I don't want him to attack me, I want us to get along. I might not even like him. I might just kind of avoid him and he'll avoid me and that's okay. If we don't attack each other, we don't care. If we like each other, we'll deal with the people I like and he can deal with the people he likes. Now one, one scenario that I've done a bunch of times when I do longer events, I don't have time to do the, the, the in-depth version now, is I will say, imagine that the people in this room we were on a boat or a plane or whatever, crashed into a uh, deserted island. We're it. We're all the people in the world right now. There's no authority. There's no 911. There's no cops. There's no courts. There's no representative to call. And I say, imagine this is the scenario. And most of us don't know the rest of us. And we don't know who we can trust. I mean, I mean there may be a couple of feds in here, and I wouldn't nearly trust them. And so I say, well, how, what would we do? Imagine that we're it. There is, no, there is no cop out available to say, well, we'll let authority handle it. Well, there isn't any. We're just sitting on an island. We're just people. What do we do? And I would go through, and, and these, these events I, I did before, I would go through in detail the different scenarios. The first one is always, well, one guy says, well, I think we need leadership here. People say, okay, maybe. What do you mean? I mean... I'm in charge, I get to tell everybody what to do, and I get to hurt anybody who disobeys me. And so I'll ask, who in this crowd would be for that? Nobody, I have yet for anybody to say, I'm for that. That's government. So in that setting, nobody I've ever met at these events has been in favor of government. When I say, well, how about if somebody stands up and says, well, I happen to teach a course on survival, and I know how to like build huts that actually keep the rain out, and I know how to start a fire without... And if, if people want to help out, like, I'll help you build your shelter if you help me build mine, and we can, like, get a team together. Anybody want to voluntarily do that? 
I've never met anybody who objected to that. Now, some people might say, I can build my own hut. I mean, you guys go right ahead. I don't need to do that. I can build my own, but yeah, I'm, I'm, why on earth would I object to people getting along voluntarily and doing that? Well, there's a term for that. It's called anarchism, which means I do these events. Everyone is against government, and everyone is in favor of anarchy. Anarchy, that scary word. In other words, voluntarism, getting along peacefully without a violent, dominating authority trying to forcibly run the show. So people are naturally what they need to be. And this is, this is why there's hope. Because we don't need people to learn some complicated solution. You know, it's so easy for people to look at politics and go, well, I voted for that guy, and four years later I voted for that guy, and everything keeps getting worse. And these people say really big words, and they must know more than I do, and, you know, it's, uh, we can't possibly handle it. So it's got to be up to the political class. You know, they have all these rituals. They must know more than us. They must be more informed. We should just leave it up to them. And it always gets worse, but... People fall for it because they think you have to be really, really smart to run things. That's one of my favorite terms is when people say, well, we need somebody to run things. Well, okay, that's really darn vague. Do you need somebody to tell you how to grocery stop, shop? Well, no, I can do that. Okay, do you have a, go to the store? You know, what, what are the things that you need to be run? In what way do you need to be run by this guy who needs to run things? Well, it's not me, it's other people. Okay, well, every individual says it's not them, it's other people, which something doesn't add up with that, because it's no individual, it's always all the other people other than each individual, which doesn't make any sense. But people speak in these vague terms, like somebody has to be in charge, or somebody has to run things, and often people say, well, I know you're against government, but I think people need to be organized. And I say... Okay, me too. And? And we need to cooperate. Yep. And? People have been trained not to recognize the one thing that makes government government, which is the right to violently rule. You can still cooperate. You can still organize. I'm not saying let's every man for himself scatter. In fact, that's one of the things I, I ask when I do this, this scenario of the island. Who's, the first thing is, who wants one boss in charge who makes us do whatever he wants? Nobody likes that. Who wants... Every man scatter every man for himself. Nobody's ever said, yeah, I'm for that. And yet people associate not having the master with every man for himself. And people will say, if you're against government, you just want everybody like living in a, like a hermit in the woods. How do you get from, I don't want someone violently dominating you, to I want you living on your own out in the woods. The only reason they make that connection is because they have, they've been trained to imagine connections that don't make any sense at all. And they speak in this vague terminology because they didn't... I say they, I did it for years and years and years. I kind of hate to admit it because it's really embarrassing. But they talk about somebody being in charge. And they, there, has, there have to be rules. That's one of my favorite ones. Well, what? They just, like, rules just appear somewhere? Or we need law. Well, what is law? Right, it's, it's the rules people have to live by. Well, like what? Like, don't attack each other. All right, I like that one. You just ruled out government. Oh, well, they get to attack us. <laughs> and that's the funny thing is everybody knows the rules that matter. We don't have to teach any complicated philosophy. And that's why what I say is I don't actually teach a philosophy. What I try to do is take one lie in people's heads and get them to see that doesn't match who they are. That lie in your head called authority and government works against you. That lie is your enemy. It goes against your values. It goes against your virtues and against your goodness. It tricks you as a good person into condoning and advocating and funding evil because you've been tricked into believing, and I was tricked into believing, that if it's done in a certain way with certain rituals and elections and constitutions, then it's okay. And I never realized for years and years that my devout well-intentioned political action was fueling evil. And I'm not being, I'm not exaggerating. Because advocating that your neighbor be violently robbed is evil. And we all recognize that except in the context of politics. Well, most of us here recognize it even in that context. But most of the rest of the world think, well, if I vote for Congress to pass a law and impose a tax on this, 
and then you have to pay it or else bad things happen to you. That's okay. That's legitimate. That's law. That's law and order. That's civilization. <laughs> Without that, we would all be wild animals. So these are not things we fundamentally believe. These are things that fundamentally go against our values and our priorities and the way we want to interact with other human beings, which is why it takes so much training for us to accept things that go directly against who we are inside what we believe in, what we actually want. Because if you ask a good person, like, describe your ideal society, nobody says, everyone's violently dominated. <laughs> if you meet someone who says that, run the other way. You know, stay as far away as you possibly can. Masochist. <laughs> right, If they want to be violently, violently dominating, you know, if they want to go to some S&M whatever, be my guest, just don't tell me I have to go. <laughs> but people, again, the, the, the reason there is hope, and so many people say, oh, it's doomed, you know, you look back at thousands of years of history, and it's violent domination, it's war and war, and this group of tyrants and this group of tyrants each send their pawns to kill each other for years and years and years, and then whoever wins, there's still a tyrant in charge. You know, the lines might change between tyrant territories. But there's still a tyrant in charge on both sides, and nasty things keep happening. We keep having war, we keep having conflict. But oh well, I guess that's how it is. The beauty is, that isn't how it is. And the, the only reason I have any hope, I mean, I remember being in, in political action, and I can remember to the point I thought, I know, if I'm being honest with myself, I know that political action cannot fix this. I can go out there and say rah 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 for the Libertarian Party, I can rah 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 against them and we need that, but I know voting will not result in freedom. And this was back when I believed in government. But if I was honest, I had to say, this isn't going to work. I don't know why I'm throwing all this effort in. The people out there seem to want this. They play the game. They go along with it. Why do I think that screaming about this for four more years it's going to suddenly make everybody choose freedom. And so I was really bummed out, thinking, you know, I can holler from the rooftops how great I am about stuff, but we're just going to lose. We'll have tyranny forever. The beauty is we won't. Because to fix the world, we don't have to fix government. If we have to fix government to fix the world, we're doomed. It doesn't fix, ever. What we have to do, and we don't even have to do anything to it. We don't have to overthrow it. You don't have to vote in a new one. If everybody who that, whose door gets knocked on by that guy says, I don't want you controlling me and I don't want you controlling my neighbor, that guy is just a wandering idiot. That is what the U.S. Congress should be. Wandering idiots who say, can't we be in charge? And 300 million people saying, no. They don't want you in charge of me. I don't want you in charge of my neighbor. Leave us all alone. And that is all that has to happen. And it's so easy to imagine government as this massive, powerful thing. Oh, it has all these resources. Yeah, it has it because we give it to them. And we give it to them, we, because most of us think we have an obligation to. If we all looked at the guy at the front door and said, go away, you're not getting any of my money, they wouldn't have any money. The politicians don't reach into their own wallets to pay for a tank or an aircraft carrier. They reach into our wallets. And if 300 million of us said, you don't get to reach into our wallets, we don't want that, they couldn't do anything. Well, they're big and powerful and they have the military. Well, last time I checked, the congressmen aren't the ones driving the tanks around. Soldiers are. And if the soldiers figure out, I don't have an obligation to do what that guy says, and I'm responsible for my own actions, then you get that the sort of liberal hippie version, which is still true, but is what if they had a war and nobody came? That's what universal acceptance of voluntarism would be. One group of tyrants says, we're going to claim that group of land. Go invade. And all the people in that piece of dirt say, who are you? You're a lunatic. Go away. And the other group of tyrants says, we have to invade that. And all the people in there says, no, we don't. We're getting along. It's fine. Please go away. All of their power. Congress doesn't show up on a battlefield. Congress doesn't fund anything. Congress doesn't produce any value, any wealth, anything that does anybody any good. All the power is because we give it to them because we go along with it. And if that goes away, they really are a paper tiger. Not even paper. They're an invisible nothing that we hallucinate into being powerful. And you can very easily do an analogy of, you know, some there's some sort of primitive tribe in some 
nasty guy who knows technology shows up and he knows how to do a few tricks to make him go ooh and ah and he says, I am a god and you must give me sacrifices and give me money and worship me and do all that. And they do it thinking that he really is all powerful. And the thing is, he is all powerful if they all think he is because they all obey him and they enforce his commands because they think he's powerful. They make it true by imagining it to be true. But the day they all go, oh, you just have some gadgets so we don't quite know how they work. But you're just one guy. We could hurl you into the volcano if you felt like it. You're just one guy. <laughs> then he isn't powerful anymore. The exact same thing is true of every government on earth, including the nastiest authoritarian regimes you can think of. Because their victims and their enforcers are the ones who gave them that power. And if they ever wake up and realize that the guy knocking at the front door is not their friend, they can take that power away. And all the politicians will be is narcissistic, sociopathic lunatics mumbling to themselves in a corner about how important they are. And you don't have to do anything to them. Nobody will even hear them. Nobody will care. It's just how poor they are. must be unpleasant to live such a deluded life. But oh well. Let's go do whatever we want. So there is hope for humanity. If you rely on politics, there isn't the slightest shred of hope in the world. But there is hope because all people have to do is outgrow a particular lie. And they already have all the virtue they need, all the wisdom they need. You know, I'm all for people being even nicer and even more intelligent. We don't even need that to get a world that is a hundred times better than we have now if they will just let go of that one lie called authority and government and just say, all right, now we're just people. What do we do? Because most people, when that's the question, they think, well, I don't want to be in violent conflict. Like, how do we cooperate in a way that isn't that? And the funny thing is that when people start to think about a world without a government, that's their first concern. How will we have a world without violent conflict if we do away with that thing that's responsible for most of the violent conflict in the world? And it is so backwards. And again, I believed it for years and years. I thought government was a civilizing influence on society. And now that I recognize what it is, I'm really ashamed I ever believed that. And I think, how did I ever believe that? And the only reason I did is because since I was a little kid, I heard it from everybody around me. Well, this is democracy, and this is great, and yada, yada, yada. So I accepted it just the way kids accept Santa Claus. The difference is when kids get old enough, parents say, well, Santa Claus isn't real. What we need is to tell all the kids, the little ones and the big ones, government isn't real either. <laughs> and then it's gone. Then it has no power. So if any, I can keep ranting at infinitum. If anybody has a question or a comment or a... I've got to be the one to ask. Who built the roads? <laughs> <laughs> the roads. <laughs> it's actually, it's actually a, a good thing to use because when we do the... The example of the island, I will ask that. Like, let's say somebody says, you know, I think it, it might be important if we want to get rescued to have a big fire. We should probably have it at the top of the mountain so people can see it from farther away. I would like to build a path up there, because right now it's jungle. Now, who is in favor of, I get to force everybody to build a path up there? Everybody says, no. Well, who would chip in some of their effort to help build a path? And some people say yes, and some people say no, and some people say, I'm more concerned with this or whatever. So in the island scenario, nobody chooses government as the solution to the question about the roads. And it's true of every other question you bring up. And I would go through um, things about protection. Like we, we have one guy who gets caught stealing stuff from other people. And this was one of the most interesting things that happened in these discussions, is I, I put the scenario of, okay, we, this guy was caught red-handed stealing <coughs> stuff from other people. A fish that somebody else caught, and he was caught stealing, and he even admitted it. What do we do about that? And that question, and then, then I would just kind of let the discussion go free for all for a while. That question is so revealing because it shows why people want authority and why you really, really, really shouldn't have authority. The why they want it is they want someone else to deal with that inconvenience stuff. Just call 911 and turn them over to the cops and don't even have to think about it because it's uncomfortable to think, here's a human being you know, we have him in custody. I don't even particularly like that. Now we have to think, how do we make him not steal fish? I don't want to, like, lop his head off for stealing a fish. That's a little harsh. 
But what do we do? And I'll have people actually have discussions. Well, what would, would you do? And some people will say, well, first of all, how about like talking to him and finding out why he thinks he needs to do that? Does it just, is it just somebody needs to around a fish, maybe? Or is there some other psychological thing? And other people are like, well, if that doesn't work, we need some sort of disincentive, like, I don't know, time to a tree for an hour. <laughs> Every time you get caught catching a fish, that's pretty humiliating. That might, might add to the deterrent. And at whatever the direction the discussion goes, the people's priority are always twofold. Stop him from hurting others and minimize the harm to him. People don't say, just whack his head off. Because they know he's a human being. We want to be as nice to him as we can while making him be nice to us. Government doesn't ever do that. And so in that case, I'll, 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 do the, I'll suggest the government solution. Well, this guy was caught stealing a fish, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to steal a bunch of your stuff and force you to build a cage for me that I will put him in. I will then steal your fish to feed him while he's in the cage that I forced you to build. <laughs> who's for that? I have yet to meet anybody who said, yeah, do that. That's great. <laughs> but that is the government solution to crime. Oh, he got caught stealing. Well, we're going to tax you, which means we're going to steal your money to build a giant cage, put him in it, and then we're going to keep stealing your money to feed him. <laughs> Nobody would ever suggest a solution that stupid except in the context of government. And that's, that's government's answer to almost every crime. So anyway, I'll, I'll cut my ranting off. And... So what, what ends up, I, I know you kind of detail the stealing concept, but I mean, really what ends up kind of being the idea for, you know, your sociopaths in every society, you know what I mean? How do we deal with it? Like, what comes up with that? Yeah, the, the, just in case people didn't, I, I couldn't hear the question, it was basically what do we do about sociopaths? Because there are sociopaths. Not everybody is nice. Yeah, you're left in the public office. That's what we do right now. It doesn't work too great. But it's a, it's a real question. And a lot of people assume that when, I'm against, when I say I'm against all government, they say, well, you must trust everybody. Because that would only work if everybody was nice. I say, I don't trust that everybody... And I'm not saying you don't have the right to defend yourself. Yes, there are actual sociopaths, pretty high percentage of them. Thankfully, a lot of them are functioning sociopaths. They, they figured out that voluntary interaction even benefits them better. You know, they wouldn't care if they harmed you, but you might do nasty things to them if they did, so they play the game the way civilized people with morals do. But some of them don't. What do we do about that? Again, in the island scenario, what I love to do is show that almost everybody already knows the answer, and I don't have to give it to them. So there is a sociopath on the island. This isn't just a fish thief. This is someone actually sneaking around murdering people. And he killed a few, and we caught him. It's like, holy smokes, you're evil and completely whacked out. You're actually committing murder for fun, apparently. What do we do? And a few people, including me, in that scenario would say, I would kill him. By myself, without a law, without a badge... I believe I would be morally justified in taking his life. And I think it would suck to have to kill another human being. That would be horrendously horrible. The only thing worse would be letting him kill another innocent. And if somebody says, wait, 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 I have a way to promise that he can't ever hurt anybody else and I'll make sure he's fed. Say, if you can convince me that you can do that, 100% guarantee you won't hurt anybody else and you're not going to rob anybody else to feed him, I could go for that. But until I'm all the way sure that the innocent are protected, his, he's not a top priority for me. And again, in normal context, people understand the right of self-defense and organizing for self-defense. You know, maybe there's a guy that you have to call, and he's a guy who has guns or whatever. You know, on the island, he wouldn't have a gun. There's a spear, and he's big and tough and really fast, and he's good at fighting. And he says, hey, if, if, if other people will give me a little bit of their food... You can call on me if there's a dispute. Now, when I show up, I'm just a guy. I'm not authority. I don't have a badge. I'm just a human with the same rights as you. I just might be a little bit more equipped at defending you from the attacker than you are. So it's a matter of ability, not right. I'm still just a human being. And the day I show up and say, I'm taxing you. You have to pay for my services. You have the right to whack my head off <laughs> to stop me from doing it because I'm still just a person. I don't suddenly acquire the right to commit aggression and so most people on most of these questions figure out, well, we could do this. And we've got to be on the lookout. And reputation is a big thing in small communities that, you know, if somebody, if it comes out that guy is a crook and he, he swindles people or he's actually dangerous, 
you know, he's done some really creepy things that we think he might actually be dangerous. We may not have proof yet. And word of mouth spreads, and everybody knows, all right, beware of that guy. And be ready to, to protect yourself from him. These are solutions that people can naturally figure out on their own. And the reason so many people put their questions in the form of what will be done about, what they mean is, what's the central plan for that? And it takes so much thought and mental exercise, and it did for me, to get to the point to realize there shouldn't actually be a central solution. Because a central solution means one guy comes up with a plan and forces it on the rest of us. I don't know what the other 7 billion people are going to do if there's a murder in their town. I can say what I might do, but who cares? I'm that one guy over there. I'm not going to be emperor of anarchy. I'm not going to rule the world. I'm not going to be in your neighborhood. I'm probably not going to do anything about the murder in your neighborhood. I can give you suggestions and what I think about it, like don't punish people unless you're really sure they actually did it, and don't go overboard on the punishment, but do make sure there aren't future victims and, and things like that. But people are so used to hearing the centralized authoritarian solutions. Well, here is my plan for how I'm going to solve the problem of poverty or crime or this or that or the other thing. And it's always based on, first, I take all of your money. And then I write a law that controls everybody. And then I, out of the benevolence of my heart, violently impose my agenda and fix the world. And we've had thousands of years of that resulting in hundreds of millions of deaths. Murders, I should say, not just deaths, not just accidental, <coughs> intentional killing of innocent human beings. And what people need to do is step into the un uncomfortable zone which says, we're now the big people, we're the grown-ups. We're not little kids in a classroom who can say, teacher, Johnny's bothering me. You say, all right, we're just, we're it. We're all there is. We're the top level, we're responsible human beings. We, on our own, have to figure out how to deal with things, and each of us are completely responsible for our own actions. None of us can say, I was just following orders. It doesn't work in an anarchist society. There cannot be Nazis in an anarchist society. There cannot be dirty cops saying, well, I didn't make the law, I'm just enforcing it, because everybody would say, you're the one doing it. You're the one responsible for what you're doing right now. Don't be beating me over the head saying, well, the law or something made this happen. You made it happen. And people only buy that excuse now because they believe in authority and law and, and legislation. If they let go of that, yes, it's uncomfortable to have to be responsible for your own actions and actually solve the problems of humanity. The good news is, if you don't imagine government, your solutions will always be better than the solutions government offer, which are always based on starting by robbing everybody and violently controlling innocent people. Yeah, I was going to say, with the situation of, uh, you know, psychopaths, sociopaths on the island scenario, um, it would get around to be ostracized as of somebody that does that, and they, you know, anybody that they try it on again, it's like individual, you know, who was asked, you learn a lesson or will be disabled permanently eventually. Mm -hmm. And um, my actual uh, I question was, like, in the scenario where government is wrong, why should we allow it? It's the individual societies or nations that we have, like say North Korea, where people are slightly more uh, indoctrinated to their children, and um, they have these weapons available. Um, say uh, America collectively decides, you know, screw government. They have this system where it's more organized. They have um, they d they want to attack us. We don't have. Uh, a ruling government in place, I think that's where a lot of people are like, well, what about the other places that might not be so benevolent or smart about it? Right. Um, to try to sort of sum up that question, is basically the, the concern over, well, what about that scary other nation over there? We're free over here and we don't have a government. What about that big nation over there that has a military or nukes and, and wants to invade us? Um, which is a perfectly rational concern. Any concern about there's a scary guy over there willing to hurt me, yeah, it would be nice if we had something we could do about it. Um, the, the first part of my answer is don't tell someone else that they're allowed to violently dominate you in the hopes that they'll stop some other person from violently dominating you because that's just insane. So let's throw that one out the window. The second is if we organize and cooperate knowing that we're, we're all just human beings, just this country, there are about 100 million gun owners. Those 100 million gun owners 
even if they were you know, no more trained, didn't organize, didn't drill, would be undefeatable by any standing military in the world. You cannot conquer a land that has a hundred million people who can kill you before you see them. It just doesn't work. Now you can nuke them and commit mass murder, but you still can't conquer them. And lastly, I would say, and this is the thing that makes people scared who are really used to government, the best, most moral, most effective, most efficient form of large-scale defense is assassination. Don't kill a million Germans because of what Hitler told them to do. Kill Hitler. Don't kill a million Chinese because of what Mao did, said. Kill Mao. And the funny thing is, it's so... I, I don't know why this didn't occur to me back when I was a statist. Why is it that all these nations will say, you're so evil, you tyrant over there, but don't worry, it's our standing policy that we never target the guy at the top. Usually support them. Yeah, we support them. And then we'll have a war and millions will die on both sides and we'll go and shake hands. Oh, Uncle Joe Stalin, yay. Yeah, I know you were our enemy like last week, but now we're our buddy, have half of Europe. And people think that's okay. And they don't recognize how bizarre it is. It's like, okay, here's this local gang and there's one guy in charge and they're committing mass murder and we caught him and ha ha, now we have him under control. We're going to punish everybody except the main guy. We let him go and give him some money and help him rebuild his house that we broke some of. <laughs> but that's foreign policy and there's an open standing policy of the UN is we don't target the bad guy at the top who's actually responsible for starting this. We'll kill as many of his pawns as we feel like. We don't care about them. They're just the, the livestock. But we don't go for the farmer because he's one of us. And if you go for the farmer, it's really cheap <laughs> and really moral. Instead of killing the underlings in the pond, say, hey, you just openly said you're going to invade our, where, our homes where we live with your army. Well, I'm not going to sit around bothering to fight your soldiers one at a time they come here. Let's have a bake sale. We raise $10 million. Whoever blows that guy's head off who just gave the command that we be violently invaded, wins. It's called and, Dexter. <laughs> it's called Dexter. And the beauty is, not only does it solve that particular invasion, but the next guy who gets in power goes, wow, they don't shoot my soldiers, they shoot me. Maybe we can like have trade and you know open exchange and voluntary interaction. That's the thing is, if you remove government from the equation, the belief in government... Even the nasty people are usually better off interacting voluntarily. In a free society, like people talk about, oh, evil, you know, greedy businessman. If somebody can't get away with something sneaky, I don't care how selfish or greedy he is. Because in a free society where people know what's going on, the way to get rich is make something that other people want to buy. And if some nasty, greedy Scrooge make something that I want to buy and gets filthy, sinking rich? I don't care. I benefited. Look, I got it. It was a benefit to me or I wouldn't have bought it. And if he gets a bajillion dollars, I don't mind. He isn't my boss. He can't force anything on me. So the evil, greedy businessman is not the problem unless there's a government that he can go to and say, by the way, can you use some of those laws to crush my competition and maybe give me a subsidy for my, the widgets I make, which means steal their money and give it to me whether they want to buy it or not. So even completely selfish, heartless people, and, and like I was saying before about the, the functional sociopaths, there are a lot of them, and most of them figure out life works better for them. You know, they couldn't care less if you suffered and died, but it benefits them to play along like a civilized human being in the vast majority of cases, unless there's a government. Then it benefits them to try to be the government. And they're always first in line, and that's... I mean, people can want, want, want government to care about us, but if you put a job description that says, violently dominate and rob all the people you know, who do you think is going to apply for the job? It's people who like to violently dominate other people, and that's, that's the job of government. And that's why sociopaths are always first in line. Wow, you're just going to put that much power in front of me, and all I have to do is say, I feel your pain. <laughs> <How> you <doing? laughs> And it works, and people think, wow, he really seems to care about me. Again, if he cared about you, he wouldn't say, can I please violently dominate you and steal your money? But people somehow keep trying to imagine that there's a way for government to be good. 
The guy who comes up and knocks on your door and says, can I violently dominate you? There's one way for him to be good, which is say, I don't want to violently dominate you anymore. There's one way for government to be good is for it to stop being government. And if people say, well, what about a government that only protects us and only defends our rights? I say, if that organization would be great. It would not be government. Couldn't tax, couldn't legislate, wouldn't have a monopoly on anything. It would just be a private security organization with the same rights as everybody else. And I could say, I don't want to pay for your services. Either I'll defend myself or I think they do a better job over there or whatever. When you take away everything evil about government, it isn't government anymore. And I admit that for years, I tried to describe a government that was legitimate and moral and still government. And it took me years to realize when it gets to be legitimate, it stops being authority and government. And then it's just humanity. So I'm all for humanity and not for violent domination. So anyway, back there. Uh, what do you think about uh, institutions which are non-governmental but still operate by uh, you know, methods of domination, authoritarian domination? So, for example, like the mental hospital that, you know, that uses coercive methods against the patients. The question was about uh, institutions that aren't government but still use authoritarian domination. The example is a mental hospital. Um, Mental hospitals sort of tie into government as things are now, because they can say, well, we've declared you insane or whatever, and by this law, we get to put you in a cage and, and do what we want to you. Um, and I would never claim that no individual institution other than government would ever try to be violent and dominate people. The thing is, if people don't recognize authority, then people would recognize such institutions as being immoral, and would either avoid them or resisting, depending on what it took to make it not happen. And there are, you know, there are gray areas that are hard to say. If somebody is, uh, one is insanity. If somebody is actually, they, they are so out of touch with reality that they're running around killing other people and they don't even, like, they're actually imagining that those other people are evil because there's something actually wrong in their head. Well, I would like to avoid killing them, but I would more like to avoid them killing somebody else. And then there's the, the, the uncomfortable question. And again, I'm not for a moment saying there aren't uncomfortable questions with our government. There still will be. The uncomfortable question is, all right, what's the minimum amount of force we can use against this person so that he stops hurting other people? And for me, the first step in the solution is the mentality. Don't imagine anybody to be authority, whether it's an institution or government. You know, the vast majority of these days is either government directly or something influenced by government. And, you know, the mental institutions are, of course, linked in with, with government authority. A million institutions are linked in. I mean, the medical industry. We make a gazillion dollars selling these pharmaceuticals, and if somebody comes along and says, well, I have a remedy that's really cheap and, and seems to work really well, and they say, hey, government, can you outlaw that, please? <laughs> I mean, the fact that there has actually been discussion of, we think you should need a doctor's prescription to have vitamin C. Those doctors are the guy at the front door. They are not there for your benefit if they want you to have to have their holy permission to get vitamin C. They are the enemy and they are the bad guy, and the only reason they're doing it is because there's a government there for them to use. Uh, and it's the same thing with, with mental institutions and, and a bunch of other things. I would draw the distinction between, you know, there are private organizations... And here's something that, that people love to sort of muddle in their heads, like the evil corporations. First of all, corporations are created by the state. There can still be big businesses, and they can still be run by greedy bastards, but in a free society, all they can do is offer to sell you something. And if one thing that people get muddled in their head about is if, if some business comes along and says, I will pay you a dollar a day to do 10 hours of hard manual labor, he's not oppressing you. If you can say no without him attacking you, he's not oppressing you. If you can't say no without him attacking you, he's governing you. <laughs> but if all you have to do is say, no, that deal sucks, I'm not going to do that. Then he, he is not an oppressor. He can be a greedy butthead, but he can't do anything to you if all he can do is give you an offer that you can say no. Now, again, that's a, an example of how big business will often you know, grab ties with government and like control all the land in some some country and say, you can either work for us or starve to death because you don't get any land and you don't get any of this and you don't get any of that. 
if the evil, greedy businessman uses force to eliminate your other options and then gives you a bad deal, that's oppression. That's unjust. But if he just comes along and says, I have a really bad deal to offer you, well, what happens if I don't go for it? Nothing. Okay, then you're just kind of obnoxious, but you're not an oppressor. There's nothing immoral about that. You're just kind of stupid, and I don't want to play. So again, so many of even the secondary oppressions and injustices depend upon government power, or they don't even exist, even when the oppressor happens to be private, or appear private, like the big nasty corporations. Like I always say, take those big nasty corporations, take away their ties to government, and see how big and nasty they are the next week, when they don't have this massive armed force of, of authoritarian thugs doing their bidding when all they can do is offer to sell you something. And if they say, guess what, we own the whole continent just because we say so, and 300 million people say, no you don't, you've only been here, we live here, go away. Corporation goes, oh darn, we don't have an army, we're just us. And even the private armies have to be like authorized by government and have the cooperation and tolerance of government. You know, things like Blackwater and the, the nasty mercenaries, people say, well, what about them? I say, well, guess who they almost always work for? The government, who says, by the way, you're allowed to go in and terrorize these people, whether from this country or some other country. So, so often the injustices that even appear private to begin with, you follow the tentacles back and they come from government. Because without that, without the ability to violently dominate people, I don't care what somebody offers me if I can just say no thanks. So since we do currently live under the state or surrounded by people who have adopted the delusion of the state, what does the individual do when someone comes to the door like one of their enforcers, one of their collection agents, one of their regulators? What recourse do we have in order to, to confront that civil disobedience, opting out? Is it just as simple as just stop participating and try to encourage other people to do likewise? What, what's our recourse? Right. The, the question is basically, since we do live in a society where people do believe in government and there is this big, powerful thing, because people will carry out its orders and enforce its will, what do we do? You know, if you're the only one who gets that this isn't legitimate, well, you know, the SWAT team at your front door probably won't want to have a nice discussion about it. What do we do in a world where there are people willing to, to commit oppression? And again, I would say the first step is an answer that, that, that everybody in the island scenario would understand. Like I use the example of, okay, we just found out the island, the next island over, you know, there's 30, 40 of us, there's 400 cannibals on the other island, they're headed over and they're going to eat us. They outnumber us, you know, so maybe don't try democracy, that's not going to go too well, because they'll just vote to eat us and then eat us. But what do we do about it? If we are outnumbered by the people who advocate violence, what do you do? The first thing is, you don't, you know, self-preservation isn't a sin. If the guy shows up at the, your door, if the choices are hand over some money or die, you might want to choose to hand over some money. Ultimately, the answer is changing the mentality of the people. And we don't get to the final answer to the problem until enough people understand that. In the meantime, everybody has the right of self-defense. And this is the thing I've, I've written about and made videos about and offended and horrified lots of people. Because I've talked about the use of forcible defense against government aggressors. Aggressors who have a law that says they're allowed to. I made a video called When Should You Shoot a Cop? Which freaked out tons of people. And it looks back in time and says, look through history how often the law enforcers were the ones committing mass murder. Now do you really want to tell me that it's never okay to resist the, an aggressor as long as some politician wrote a law saying it was okay? What Mao did, what Stalin did, what Hitler did, what Pol Pot did, they legalized it first because they were authority. We're allowed to do this, ha ha, here we go. And Obama. Which, and Obama, and every other president in, <laughs> in this country's history. But, so yeah, there is that problem that if you're the only one who knows you're free, it's going to be kind of dangerous. And you still have the right to defend yourself. And in certain cases, you might not want to, because self-preservation might be a better idea than dying in a blaze of glory. And that's a line that, you know, I have my line in a few places, a few things that I will not let them do. I would forcibly resist even if it means I die. But I don't tell other people where to draw that line. I do tell people, if you haven't even thought about that line, or if you don't have a line, you are absolutely a slave. If they can do anything they want to you, and you will never resist, you're already a slave. 
You know, your line might be nowhere near mine, but you better have a line or you're already doomed. You will never be free because you don't even think you should be free because you already think it's evil to defend yourself if the aggressor is law. So, I mean, I can tell where my line is, but kind of who cares? <laughs> but people better have a line or, you know, you don't get free. Basically, if you're a slave who thinks you're supposed to be a slave, you will be a slave forever. And one of the things... Um, one of the most amazing things I've ever read was the works of Frederick Douglass, who was a slave. And to me, the impressive thing was not that he physically escaped slavery, it was that he mentally escaped it. And to read his accounts of how a lot of the slaves were convinced that they were supposed to be slaves and actually viewed runaway slaves as thieves for stealing themselves from the master. And most people go, how could anyone do that? And I say, do you take pride in being a law-abiding taxpayer? Do you have scorn for the people who try not to pay? Guess what? You're the slave who hates the other slave who tried to run away and views him as the thief for trying not to be robbed. It's still you. They changed the terminology, but they kept the lie, and you still fall for it. And when that lie goes away, and enough people do it, uh, resisting is really easy. You ignore them. Until then, things are likely to get ugly, because when a certain number of people are willing to stand up for their rights, and a lot of people aren't, it usually ends in a violent conflict of one kind or another. And that's why what I focus on is trying to get people's minds to change because that ugly thing that's going to happen in between is not going to be fun for anybody. Um, I think the U.S. empire is falling. I think a lot of nasty things are going to happen. But ultimately, what I care about is what happens on the other side, and that depends entirely on how many people actually understand and want freedom. I don't care if they hate this particular regime. That doesn't matter in the slightest to me. We've gone through cycles of regimes forever. What matters is when the cycle ends, is people choose freedom. Oh, that last thing we'll you said. You. Oh. <laughs> Me or him? You yeah. first. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> but that last thing you said, though, is like, that's why I think that we're, we're still in the kind of the education phase of trying, you know, because if you took out government today, we'd just be back in the same boat, you know. But, yeah. But uh, what I was going to say is that a lot of those great, in my experience a lot of those gray area questions you know about anarchism come from the fact that your earlier point because everybody thinks that, oh well anarchism then everybody goes to back to being cavemen or something but but how you know what well, I guess I wanted to push maybe a question or statement maybe I want to hear your voice on it it's like how a lot of those problems get fixed with like uh, voluntary economics you know I mean, I mean how big is that but you know I mean uh, you know, you, everybody, you know, not just economics meaning money, but just within trade and interaction with people. And so, you know, what what's your statement or, you know, in a uh, voice about what that is and how to explain it to people? Right. I don't know that I can possibly paraphrase what you just said. <laughs> Anybody who wasn't here just doesn't get to know the question. Um, yeah, there, people have a lot of power even if they don't forcibly resist. Even if, you know, by just the way they treat other people, the way they trade, the way they spend their money, the way they live, even a minority of people can have a pretty big impact. Um, and a few examples that come to mind is, I look forward to the day when nobody is comfortable being a tax collector because even just half of the people they meet think they're the root of all evil. Because if half the people you meet think you're the root of all evil, you might consider a career change. <laughs> and that's actually been a major problem for the IRS for decades, that it's really hard to keep them staffed. They have a really fast turnover rate because they get the job and find out everybody hates them. And everybody should hate them. Because ostracizing thieves is a good thing. And again, even if they don't care morally, if they have to be faced every you know day in and day out with you know angry people being huffy about them and robbing them, or just people in general saying, "Ew, you work for the IRS, Blah, please go over there. I don't want to have anything to do with you." That's very powerful. The same thing with with cops or soldiers or any organization that that uses the initiation of violence. If everyone around them condemns them, they feel a, a major pressure, whatever their own moral code. They feel a major pressure to stop doing that. And that's why I think it's really important, and there are certain things that are trained into us that people, it, the, the, the people in power know they have to really solidly train these certain things in. Like, of course I support the troops. I don't support the troops. If you're a soldier for any government, you're the bad guy, quit and go home. 
And the thing is, if everyone in the country said that, nobody would be in the U.S. military. It doesn't mean nobody would defend us, because if somebody invaded, I know lots and lots of people who aren't in the military who would say, well, I would definitely be one of the ones ready to forcibly defend against an actual invasion. But these are just religious things, and the way people are trained into nationalism and patriotism to feel this deep, profound pride, because you have to train people into that to get them to keep going along with it. Because imagine if... And, and it's really sad, and I do feel for soldiers who have good intentions and go off and do it. And Vietnam is just a really, really sad testament to what authority does to all the good people. The people who went over, the people who protested, everybody involved. People go over and it's like, well, I thought I was going over to like fight for freedom or justice or something or other, my country at least. I came back and everybody hated me. A bunch of evil stuff happened over there that I was not proud of. And the same thing with Iraq war and every other war. And thankfully, there are now a lot of soldiers that come out and say, you know, I joined up to do good stuff and I figured out we're actually the bad guys. You know, they're the bad guys too. We're not the only bad guys, but I don't think adding some more bad guys to the equation was really the answer. And I come back and a lot of people hate me and that's kind of uncomfortable. And, you know, the suicide rate among soldiers is amazingly just horrible. And it isn't, and I, again, I offend people by saying this, but I don't care. I don't think it's because I saw really horrible things. If I saw something really horrible, my first thought is not, I'm going to kill myself. If I did something really horrible, my first thought would be, I should not be on this planet if I'm capable of that. And I believe a lot of military suicides are that. And, and I know a bunch of soldiers who say, yes, the suicides are because of that. You know, you can see horrible things and it can really mess you up and gross you out. You don't want to kill yourself because somebody else did something evil. You want to kill yourself because you did something evil. And it's a very, I, you know, it's horrible that that happens at all. I love the fact that we now have the internet so that lots and lots of soldiers can come out and say, I joined up for good reasons, I thought we were the good guy, and then at one point I suddenly noticed, holy smokes, I'm that evil thing that the world needs protecting from. And so I quit. And, you know, to any soldier, I would much rather that instead of killing yourself, you did the braver thing, which is come out and say, I was wrong. I was one of the bad guys, and I'm sorry, and I will never do that again, and I will try to talk other people out of doing that, of being soldiers, of joining the military, of being the police. That is a far braver thing than just taking your own life, because that doesn't fix what you did. If you want to fix what you did, make it so the next guy with good intentions doesn't fall for the same lie. Okay, two things, one comment, one question. Okay. We shouldn't get mixed up between the politicians and the government. We don't elect the government, we elect the politicians. Politicians haven't governed for a very, very long time, since World War II. The politicians are the public relations agency for the government, and it doesn't matter which public relations agency they use, right? They will rubber stamp into law bills that have been decided and drafted by people in secret elsewhere a long time before that passed through Congress, unreadable bills, and nobody reads them, they just rubber stamp them into law. So let's not mix that one up, and let's not call the whole process democracy either, because I know you had to get kind of through that one fairly fast, and I understand, mm -hmm. but they're very different things. I, I, the question I have is, um, if an authoritarian society meets a relatively free society, I'll give you a, a real historical example. Crazy Horse and his Lakota, a very free society, was up against the U.S. military for the second half of 1876, we'll say, after the Big Horn, and for most of 1877. Now the US military, absolute hierarchy, orders from the top. The Lakota, they were entitled to fight the war or leave the, leave the band. But somewhere along the line, Crazy Horse and some of the, kind of the elders said, no, we're under too much threat, you can't leave. And some families did try to sneak away at night. So, Crazy Horse and the Warriors came to those people and they took their lodge poles and they burned them and they took their horses and they confiscated them. My question, was, there, was that wrong? Was that morally wrong? What yes. They, what they did? And what was the alternative is the second part of the question. I don't... It, 
Uh, let me back up. The first thing, he, he made the distinction between government and the politicians, and I'll cover that after we cover this. And he brought up the example of the when an authoritarian um, empire, whatever you want to call it, is up against a relatively free society, he used the example of the Lakota Indians, yeah. crazy horse, and, yeah. um, who resisted for a while. And he talked about the example of the, the Lakota who said, let's just kind of sneak away, we don't really want to play this. Yeah. And were actually punished by their own kind for running away. And he asked if that was immoral, and I said yes. Because then, crazy horse and whoever become the aggressors. Now, if I'm in this room and somebody's saying they're going to come attack me, and the rest of you go, mm -hmm, I have nothing to do with this, and walk away, I don't have the right to attack you. I can say, you bunch of chicken turds, thanks a lot. <laughs> but if I attack you, I'm just as bad as the guy coming to attack me. And the thing is, a free society does not guarantee the good guys win. And that's, that's one of the biggest things, is what good people want government for, is a guarantee that the good guy will win. The thing is, government always guarantees the bad guy will win. Lack of government doesn't guarantee anything in, in any direction. Because maybe you have a giant, in that case a giant authoritarian empire, with lots of soldiers and lots of guns, and the soldiers will blindly do it, they're told, and commit genocide, which basically happened in this country, to the, the American Indians. And there is no magic guarantee that the good guys will win if they believe in freedom, which is, again, why it's a numbers game. What if all those soldiers for the U.S. cavalry and military and the rest of them said, these people are already living here, I don't think it's okay to attack them just because some guy in a house over there wrote down that, yeah, they don't get to be here anymore. Again, the answer was for the enforcers to wake up, and in that case, obviously, they didn't. And there was, you know, mass murder and then and, and, and forced eviction from where people would live for thousands and thousands of years. Um, but I don't ever think, let's add a new authority and a new aggression is ever the answer, because then you just have two evils to choose between. But sometimes doesn't discipline have to fight discipline? I know it's an emergency situation and it should always, always be temporary. Another example comes to mind is a ship or a boat, right? A boat is an emergency situation. A meeting, in a way, is a kind of an emergency situation. You can only have one person speaking at a time, so you have to give authority, which we've kind of given to you as, as chairman of the meeting. But you didn't, and I can demonstrate it. Everybody here, give me a thousand dollars. <laughs> I don't have the right to rule. We're here voluntarily. You to preside over the meeting, not the robbers. But that's not, like, the only authority here is an authority, which is the people who own the place said we're allowed to be here, and the people who arranged it said, I'm going to be the one standing up here. I can't do anything to your person and your wealth except say, According to the people who own the place, you don't get to be in their place. Authority is just a name for psychological power. That's all it is. It's well, delusion. Yeah. It's, it, yeah, in the very broad sense, but there's a big difference between saying, well, well, you know, right now you're the guy talking and saying you have the moral right to rule us. There's a gigantic distinction. I think voluntary is the difference. Yeah, it's I'm voluntary. Right We're all here voluntary. Was anybody like threatened with violence if they didn't come here? Was anybody threatened with violence if they walk out? Well, we didn't, you know, you didn't force us to give it to you. We gave it to you for the length of the meeting. Right, or walk out in the middle. You're allowed to walk out in the middle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nobody locked the door. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the, 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 the distinction is, is it voluntary or involuntary? And the involuntary, even if it's for some supposedly noble good, and an example I like to use that makes, you know, everybody gets the answer right is, if I had the power to violently make all of you exercise for two hours a day and eat a healthy diet, you cannot deny that it would benefit you in health ways. Does anybody think I have the right to do that? No. No. Why not? It would benefit you. It would benefit the common good and the individual. Because you own yourself, and I don't have the right to commit aggression even for your own good. So I have to sit here and let you eat unhealthy and not get exercise. Here's what I do too, by the way. <laughs> Poor me. I don't get to make you be what you should be for your own good. That's called freedom. We already are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see, you and then you. Okay, um, a popular meme that's been spreading through the resistance in general here, in terms of everything, is you lose your freedom the second you fight for it. It's something I kind of disagree with. I was wondering what your take on it is. Uh, you're talking about the meme of the, the sort of saying thing of the, you lose your freedom as soon as you fight for it. 
there's definitely that balance when it's, it's a minority of people who actually believe in freedom and want it, and the first guy who stands up is usually the guy who the tank runs over. And the thing is, again, on a practical basis, or on a moral basis, self-preservation is no sin. The thing is, if everybody is concerned with just themselves, I don't want to make waves. I actually just did an article about this. If everybody says, well, I'm not going to be first to stand up, then you get mass murder because the, the empire gets huge because nobody did anything. The downside is if you're the first one to stand up, you're the first one to get shot down. So there's, and the, there's a truth to that. The thing is there are lots of in-between ways to resist that are smaller or sneakier or whatever. And each person has to decide, you know, what are you willing to risk and for what cause. The thing is if everybody just, I'm going to mind my own business and take care of myself, look out for number one and, and, and not make waves, that's when authoritarianism gets really powerful. And if lots of people say, I'm going to cause trouble and you might hurt some of us, you might hurt me, you might kill me. I mean, I go around and give these talks. I'm sure there's lots of people in power who don't particularly like what I'm saying. I'm not that hard to kill. I would be really easy to kill. So far they haven't, thankfully, and I'm not going to shut up until they do. And that's the line I've drawn. I don't suggest other people draw that line. Um, but again, the mentality to me is the main thing, because the more people have it, the less risk there is to any individual. Um, but I do think if you're not willing to risk anything for freedom, just kind of get out of the way to people who are actually going to make the world a better place. To be rude about it. <laughs> uh, uh, now that you brought it up, <laughs> uh, what was the explanation offered to you on uh, why you were welcome at Fort Fest and Chris Cantwell wasn't, even though you essentially made the same point in the same media? I wasn't welcome. Um, they didn't ban me. They didn't invite me back. I also didn't ask to go back. Uh, the question was about um, why I wasn't banned from Porkfest and, and Chris Cantwell um, was there were some other, the thing is that the, 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 I'll be really quick about this because this drama is sort of in the big scheme of things, I don't really care, but it's a good question so um, the drama of them saying we don't want to be associated with somebody who talks about killing cops I said, we are, where on me, I just gave a talk last year at Porkfest called Why Speak of Violence which specifically talked about the fact that if you can't even discuss forceful resistance against an aggressor, you're just talking about how loud you're going to whine as a slave. If there's no point at which you're going to say, I'm not going to go along with this, you lose. You already completely lose. And I think there, there were personal things and there were other incidents that didn't show up in their excuse. And Chris Cantwell, you know, is very blunt, intentionally rude and admits it. You know, and I, I get along fine with him. So there was, you know, behind-the-scenes drama, but I do think it was, it was hugely inconsistent. And they, there was actually, there was a, a discussion of it at Porkfest, although it was at All Expo, like same place, same time, but not officially a Porkfest event, where we discussed that. And, and the funny thing is that was discussed more than at any other Porkfest, because they said, don't talk about that. <laughs> if you tell a bunch of amateurs, don't talk about that, get to the middle of it. So they, and I... I sort of understand, like, they don't, they want to be seen as more moderate and as not, but if your goal is to be accepted by a society that condones mass oppression, you lose. Like, the world doesn't ever change because you say what other people are comfortable with hearing. The world only changes when you say a truth that other people don't want to hear. To follow that up, I think that... Uh, you know, in their attempt to, to mute the point of Chris Campbell, uh, they ended up uh, with, you know, several hundred wanted posters all around the camp down. It. Yeah. A ton of attention brought to it. And they made him louder, right. and they made the message louder, and they made more people talk about it. So it didn't, you know, it doesn't work well when you tell, you know, voluntarists what they can talk about. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, uh, what is your opinion about compulsory education? Um, for children, it's evil, but keep going. When there's a social imperative um, to work for, you're saying, a big corporation, because there's only the only way of getting money is either from that big corporation, from a corporation, any corporation, or from the government. Um, what do you think about those institutions both being um, coercive and 
institutionally, um, you know, institutionally authoritarian. Right? Okay, the two questions were, well, the first was about compulsory education, um, which is basically imprisoned authoritarian indoctrination, and it's completely immoral. Um, there's actually, I, I've helped with some videos that, that Josie the Outlaw has done, one is called The Prison by Any Other Name, that is about compulsory education and how it's, it isn't teaching people to think, it's teaching people to accept slavery. Um, so my short answer is it's immoral. You don't get to imprison people just because they're little. Um, the other question was about when, when corporations or governments, when you're sort of stuck with the choice of you have to work for them or you kind of starve. Again, a corporation can't do that on its own without the government forcibly, legally ruling out other options. Um, and a lot of that has to do with land ownership. Like a government will show up and say, everything from this line to the line 5,000 miles over there, it's ours. You don't own any of it. We're going to give it to our huge corporation buddies. And unless you want to starve to death, you don't have any land. You don't get to farm. You don't get to hunt, gather, do what, anything. If you want to live on that land that we just declared we own, you have to pay us rent, known as property taxes. And golly gee, it happens that thanks to us, the only uh, option you have is to work for our buddies in this giant corporation. Again, they can't force that unless they have the government there to do it. And so they get intertwined, and people blame the corporations and often miss. And, you know, using government to do that is completely immoral. So what the corporations do is immoral, but people miss the fact that they can't do that if there isn't a government there. Like, if a private company showed up and said, uh, we own all of Argentina, and everybody living there said, no, you don't, the corporation would go, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> it's like, I'm a CEO, what am I going to do? Go door to door and tell them you have to unless they have a big, powerful government that they can convince to enforce their claims, again, all they can do is offer jobs or offer to sell goods, and all people have to do is go, no, I can farm my own, I can work for somebody else, I can you know, do whatever. If you're not ruling out my other options, you're not oppressing me. Was there a follow-up? Or... Okay. I was wondering how the mere elimination of government would work to correct the incredible wealth disparity prevalent in this country? Um, two things. The question is about how removal of government would, would deal with uh, the huge wealth disparity. Um, on the one hand, I don't care about wealth disparity. If somebody else got ridiculously wealthy off of voluntary exchange, which means every time he had an interaction with anybody else that made him that rich, they wanted to do it, I don't care. If somebody has $20 billion from trading with people who wanted to trade with him, I don't mind. And there's a word for minding. It's called coveting. And for Christians, it's a sin. I'm not a Christian. But I think it's the envy that drives a lot of, of government redistribution things is worse than the greed of the guy who wants tons of money. If he gets it voluntarily. However, if they don't have the government to give them monopolies and giant advantages, I think naturally a free market tends to even out a lot more than it does now. What about the wealth that's not dependent on the market, like land? Oh, yeah, land ownership. Right now, the, the, and I don't want to get into this too much, but it, the, the concept of, of homesteading. Somebody doesn't get to step on the continent and go, this is mine. Anybody who lives between that and 5,000 miles over there has to pay me rent is bogus. Nobody has the right to do that. Uh, the concept that, that land ownership comes from homesteading, from using it. Like, I built a farm here, I built my house here, nobody else was here, I didn't kill somebody and then do it. And having just come on a train across the country, I can tell you there's a lot of unused land here, but the government claims all of it. So you don't get to say, I'm going to live here. In fact, even if it gives you the land, it says, you have to keep paying us for the privilege of owning your own land, we call it property taxes. And that's immoral too. And so right now, without government, there's lots and lots and lots of land, and it's not desolate wasteland, that people have the absolute right to go to and say, I'm just going to live here, build, build a house here. I mean, Frontier Days was basically that. Well, there's nobody here. I'm going to build a house, and then it's mine, and this is my land. Now, if you have a 1,000 people in two square miles, it gets really problematic. So far, we're not at that. But yeah, when, when governments by themselves or corporations by way of governments saying, we own this giant tract of land just because we said so, 
Now you have to pay for the privilege of standing on it. Yeah, that's bogus. That's, I mean, it's like me saying, uh, by the way, I own the planet. If you, you want me to leave if you want. But if you want to stay on this planet, you each have to give me $100 a month to pay for rent for my planet. And that's basically what every government does, only most people believe it when government does it. Um, but no, you don't get to just own a giant amount of land by saying you do. So that's sort of the, the libertarian answer to that. This is a quick comment. I, I'm just totally amazed. For centuries, they're, they've had government. They've never, they've always <laughs> failed. And we just keep doing the insanity over and over and over again. It gets kind of disappointing sometimes or depressing. Yeah, it's talking about the fact that we do government over and over and over again for thousands of years. And people keep trying and keep thinking, if we just somehow arrange this right, it'll work. And people just, they never seem to learn the underlying problem. And we go from one nasty empire to another one because people think, and this is sort of cliche, I say it all the time, but I'm going to keep saying it all the time, people think the problem is the guy who's on the throne. The problem has never been the guy on the throne. The problem has always been there's a throne to be on. And if you knock that guy off the throne, the next guy in line is going to be a sociopath. And you look how often in history you have a revolution against one nasty authoritarian regime, and you get a new nasty authoritarian regime. And to me, one of the most useful things the founding fathers of this country did was demonstrate what a bad idea limited government is. <laughs> it was the most limited attempt to ever make a government, and it turned into the most powerful authoritarian empire the world has ever known. If that doesn't show you that limited government doesn't stinking work, I don't know what will. When people... <laughs> So, and it is, it is depressing, like uh, reading Schindler's List and the di diary of Anne Frank and realizing the main opposition to the Nazis were the communists. And to me, that's just so depressing. <laughs> really? <laughs> Your answer to a big collectivist authoritarian regime Well, there was a third a party. There were the mild socialists. The mild socialists. <laughs> right. like moderates. Yeah, the moderates. Yeah, absolutely. No moderation. <laughs> the fact that that's all they could think of. Because being able to recognize one evil, whoopee do. Like if somebody's stomping on you, being able to say, I don't like this. Well, no kidding. Who does? The thing is, if you got the chance to be the stomper or to tell the stomper what to do, would you? Everybody who votes and believes in government would. That's what has to stop. I don't just want this guy not stomping on me. I want no one stomping on anybody. I mean, every nasty, tyrannical regime started by fighting against some other injustice. Right. What Hitler railed against were real evils that should have been railed against and should have been fought against. Only the people were in the authoritarian mindset. They replaced one with another. Same thing with Mao, same thing with Stalin, same thing all, same with the U.S. Quite really worse, too. Yeah. yeah, and it ends up worse in the long run. Because, but luckily now, after however many thousands of years of going around circles, there are more and more people, and it's accelerating amazingly in the last few years, who recognize, hey, how about we not have the throne there anymore? Because every time you put somebody up there, he's an evil bastard who stops on people and commits mass murder. Take the throne away. Stop putting a new guy on it. And that is what has to happen to stop the cycle, and it is going to stop. And it's, again, it's amazing to watch the speed. I've been an anarchist for 18 years. And I can tell you that 10 years ago, I knew maybe half a dozen people who would dare to call themselves anarchists. And now I know thousands and thousands who have figured out the problem is the guy at the door who says, just let me dominate you and your neighbors. It isn't that it wasn't the right guy at the door. It isn't that you chose Bubba instead of him. <laughs> it's that you accepted the idea that that can never be legitimate. And that is going away. And it will all the way go away. When people ask me, like, well, what are the chances that we'll ever have a society without government? 100%. Absolutely 100%. I don't know exactly how long it will take, but it is 100% for the same reason that it was absolutely destined to be that eventually society would stop thinking the earth was flat. Because the truth is going to stare them in the face until they figure it out. And when they figure it out, they're never going back to the lie. And when people figure out the lie underlying authoritarianism and government, they don't go back. Which means it's a one-way thing. And we're, you know, people who understand it are a small minority, but growing, it isn't ever going to go back the other way. It will expand until everybody recognizes that government is basically 
Santa Claus only with 200 million dead people. And when they figure that out, they aren't going back to that lie ever again. So we will have a society without government. I would just like to get there really fast and minimize the destruction that happens in the meantime as the control freaks try to hang on to their power. I have a favorite question that I always ask the statists, and it always scratches their heads, and I want your opinion. Okay. What the hell is government? Good. His favorite question to ask statists is, what is government? And I do that too. I ask it all the time. Uh, well, it's it's sort of something. And that somebody, I actually, I did talk about this, and somebody made a little alien video called Government Explained. <laughs> I like his version better than mine. And it's an alien comes to Earth and asks, you know, like, hi, here I am. And the guy says, should I take you to our leader? You're what? <laughs> the leader. The guy in charge. The guy in charge of what? The guy in charge of everything. One guy in charge of everything. And he goes through, and the alien is trying to understand what this government thing is, and the guy's trying to explain it. Well, it's not really the buildings. It's not the books. And it's sort of the politicians, but not really. And people don't know. And the thing is, when you, when you try to get them to actually define it, you start to, to see that it really is a religious belief. I used to think the belief in government was analogous to a religious belief, and then I realized it's not an analogy. It is a belief in a superhuman entity that you can't see, that has rights that human beings don't have, that gives commands that it's a sin to disobey. That's called a god. <laughs> And I believed in it for a lot of my life. <laughs> That's really embarrassing. But most of what I do now is try to talk other people out of the goofy thing that I accepted for years and years and years. Because it is totally a faith-based belief, a belief in a mythical deity. And most people don't see it that way, obviously, because as soon as they see it that way, they let go. I think I can tell you what government is, but it, it, it begs another question, and please ask me. Government is the administration of the state, right? Or by extension, the administrators of the state. And of course, the question is, what is the state? Yeah, thank you. Well, we're not going to be given that definition anywhere. We used to have a radio show called The Bear Truth, myself and Andy Martin Smith. The, okay, Washington said that government is not reason or eloquence, it's force. Chairman Mao said it's, um, what was it, that political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. One is poetry, the other is prose. But there's a clear enough definition of the state, and unfortunately, it's real. The state is the organization of coercive power over a territory. That's what the state is. You can pick any state you like. Not Nevada, that's not even a province anymore. But the Roman Empire, or Hitler's Germany, or the United States of America, they're all organizations of coercive power. Unfortunately, coercive power isn't a myth. It's very real. It's all too real. But you missed an ingredient. So, yeah. it, he was basically saying how the state is a, a, an organization, of course, of power, which is totally true, yeah. but you missed the fundamentally so great... Psychological greatest. power is added to it, but without psychological power, you can still have the state. No, you can't. You, you can't. can't. Well, the state is in your mind. That's all it is. What? That's all it is. It's in your mind. I'm sorry. I'm gonna... the, yeah. Like, instead of, like, we can argue about what the word state means. The yeah. word government is defined as the exercise of authority over a people or place. Authority is the right to rule, not just the ability. People don't call the Bloods and Crips government because they don't think they have the right. So you left out the ingredient of perceived Psych legitimacy. Psychological power, and it's, it's, it's an adjunct. The Union Army had no psychological power in big chunks of Alabama. They were still the government during Reconstruction. Well, because they have a brute force. No, governments love psychological power. They will go to, on their knees to churches, on the modern church's television. But it's not the necessary definitive ingredient of government. Government is coercive power. Psychological power is, it, is its help or its aid or its better or its everything else. But it isn't government without authority. In the case where one group doesn't recognize it, another one does. The gang is real, the guns are real, the soldiers are real, the violence is real. But nobody, the people who call it government, imagine it to be something other than just a gang of violence. They think it's a rightful, legal ruling class, even if they complain about it. The people in Alabama in 1866 thought the Union government was a bunch of murdering thugs. And they were right. They still had to obey them. <laughs> because of the force. That doesn't make them authority. Force defines government. 
No, it doesn't. Because, because then the Bloods and Crips and every carjacker would be gone. Alabama. They force will be controlled. Yeah, yeah. Like brute force, without psychological thought or authority, the same thing. Yeah, the the ability to violently control does not make something government. Yes, it, it does. That's what does. Does. So every carjacker is government. No, yeah, every carjacker. Why not? He has the ability to violently control. Have, they don't have the power the government has. They don't have coercive power. They're not an organization. You don't think a carjacker has coercive power? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you look like at carjack. It's, it's, not gonna go well. it's an organization of coercive power, a permanent organization. Mafia? A per- getting very close. Nobody <laughs> calls the mafia government because they don't think it's legitimate. They can accept taxes and they're a permanent organization and they can afford you. And mafia. Of course you want to do it. And nobody calls them government. Almost identical. Yeah, except people don't imagine them to be authority, so they don't call it government. Thanks for the perfect example (laughs) that authority is the ingredient that makes a government. Because mafia is almost exactly the same, except its victims don't imagine it to be legitimate, so they don't call it government. Charlemagne went to Rome in the year 800. He went down on his knees, and the Pope put a kind of oil in his head, and he did a whole lot of stuff over it. Like Charlemagne came back, he was still ruling the, the countries he conquered by brute force, but now he had this enormous psychological power to back him. Yeah. Governments love psychological power. They, they will do all kinds of things to court and molly coddle it. Yeah. But it's not the essential ingredient. Government is force. George Washington said it, government is not reason, it's not eloquence. Reason and eloquence is psychological power. And he left out an ingredient, which government I don't blame him for because he wanted to be it. <laughs> well, two seconds later, he was violently attacking people who didn't want to pay homage to him as government, as authority. We both agree it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I admire the optimism that someday people will lose the idea of embracing the state, but just like you alluded to and even wrote, that it's pretty much a superstition, a cult. There are billions of people who believe in religions and things like that, superstitions and cults. How do you fight an idea where every day that idea is also trying to gather new followers who say, it's okay, you're not really a slave, you get to play master a lot of the time too. Just like we're never going to eliminate all crime, I don't, I'm not really optimistic enough to think that we can eliminate every government entity within every district and domain. We just okay. need, we need a limited religion. <laughs> <laughs> He's talking about how do you fight against the superstition that's constantly, you know, there are people pushing it because they have power for it, and there are lots of other superstitions that people believe in and they, and they follow. It's very appealing. And, and, yeah, it's appealing. It's a, it's a way for people to get out of personal responsibility. It's a, it's a great emotional and mental crutch for a lot of people. A couple distinctions I would give. First of all, again, I can prove... To any individual, I'm actually working on interactive things, so I don't have to do this one at a time, to prove to every individual that the belief in government goes against his own values. Like, it's not just, I don't like the outcome, it's that every single person who believes in government has a contradiction inside his own head. He's betraying himself by believing it. And there's a lot of superstitions that's not true. I mean, if someone wants to worship a giant pink armadillo, I don't really care. Be my guest. I'm not even going to bother to try to talk you out of it unless you tell me that your giant pink armadillo told you to come kill me. Then we kind of have a problem. People make a lot of compromises and become hypocrites in their beliefs, though, like their religion, their superstition. They'll even act contrary to it despite the fact that their intellect should tell them not to. Right, right. And there can definitely be you know, cognitive dissonance that makes people behave a stupid way because of a belief they were taught to believe. Um, one nice thing is it's it's a lot harder to disprove any god than it is government. The disproofs of government are pretty darn simple. Um, my book, The Most Dangerous Superstition, gives three in the span of like ten pages. Complete logical disproofs of the possibility of government being legitimate. It's not that sometimes it's bad, sometimes it gets corrupt. It's that it literally can't exist. It's like saying, I believe in being a militant pacifist. <laughs> well, look at the words until you figure out that conceptually cannot be. Authority cannot be. And so, luckily, it's easier to disprove than a deity on some other plane of existence. Like, I don't care if you believe in whatever you believe in, unless it's telling you to attack me, which government always is. Um, But I think that, you know, people do claim to a lot of, of, of superstitions, and people have done that for thousands of years. 
this particular one is less sane than most of the other ones and easier to disprove and makes more blatant contradictions in people's heads. Uh, and the thing is, a superstition is only tempting if there are lots of other people. If, there, if you're the only one believing some weird superstition that other people don't accept, people let go. A popular superstition is what people want so they can be part of the club that all worships that thing or believes in this thing. Uh, authoritarianism is going to get less and less popular until the people who still believe in, oh, you old-fashioned weirdo that think these pieces of paper give someone the right to rule, divine right of politicians. It's going to take a long time to get to the whole earth. I'm not saying, you know, next week people are going to figure this out. Um, the beauty, and I think most people will never intellectually figure it out. They will be dragged forward by the smart people. It sounds really rude, but that's human history. Most of humanity doesn't didn't figure out that slavery is bad. It took a bunch of rebels to say, this is bad, let's not do this. And there's people, oh, I guess it's kind of bad, let's not do that. So the world doesn't change because the majority understands something. It's because they get dragged along by a few troublemakers who do understand it. The good news is, even dragging along an unthinking majority still can get to a really good result. We don't accept open slavery. Well, not if it's called slavery anymore. <laughs> Basically, you're not allowed to call it that anymore. You still do it and call it tax. Oh, well, it's called being a citizen. Yeah, now you're a law-abiding tax-paying citizen. Um, but I think it's, I do think it's, it's destined to fall apart because it's, it's a lie that doesn't even rely on some supernatural being. It's a lie just concocted around pieces of paper and human beings, which is the most bogus, weird lie ever. Um, and makes less sense than any other superstition I can think of. It's going to take a long time to get to the whole world, but learning by example is how most people will see it. Is, oh yeah, we can either have this really stupid perpetual war and enslavement, or we can do what those people over there are doing and interact voluntarily. Let's do that. So we don't need the whole world to understand it intellectually to sort of be dragged along in the direction of humanity, which is you know what humanity's been doing for thousands of years in a lot of other ways. Do you think the, the um, sorry? <laughs> you go ahead, man. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, like you kind of said it there too, but like it is a terrible way to prove that it can be done. Is the fact that we have almost 300 million people that believe in government right now, and it's because of childhood indoctrination into knowing it. But our our goal is is just to break the indoctrination and actually be smart about things, you know. And so it's possible. That's why I would say to people when they're telling me, "Well, it can't work because you know it's never been tried or whatever," you know. Well, that's why we're in the education phase right now. We need to right. make sure that other people can know, know about it, know the truth, and can say, "Well, you know, like for me, I might be a, a, a really good example of this. I've been, I was, I was a." youth pastor at one time. I was, a, I was uh, in special operations in the military for 10 years. You know, I was a part of the state and the parasite. But because I found this, you know, found out that there's a way to, oh my God, you know, there's a hole there. Let me, let me make it bigger. And I saw that I'm, you know, I don't have to be a, such a, a jerk anymore. You know? <laughs> I mean, and believe in statism. You know, it, it's, it's freeing and it will be to everybody. You know? Yeah. Out. And one really good sign is that the fact that it takes this much effort and indoctrination to teach someone to accept authoritarianism that shows how vulnerable the superstition is. Now, right now, it's kind of all over the place. But the fact that you have to start pounding into the kids' heads by you know, the time they can even talk, if it doesn't happen, then it doesn't happen at all. Like Then you don't have to deprogram. Like but My daughter doesn't need to be deprogrammed from authoritarianism. I don't know how she's going to rebel against two anarchist parents, but it'll be fun to watch. <laughs> but, and I can see it just as a generation, gener generational thing. I can almost talk. I hiked 16 miles yesterday in Yosemite. Don't hold me to too high a standard here. Um, but people, because, because it takes so much indoctrination, and when people don't have that, they let go of it really quickly. I mean, it took me years to let go of that last little shred of authoritarianism. I see people doing it in days and weeks now, who, you know, when they're in their 20s. Right. And like, oh yeah, they don't have the right to rule me, so yeah, it's illegitimate. It's so like, okay, you speak it sounds so simple. Why did it take you like four years to accept something so bleeding obvious? 
And so it is speeding up, not just the number of people doing it, but how fast they're doing it. And when a lie, the thing is, if the lie is all around you, um, anybody who hasn't heard about the, the experiments done by Solomon Ash, they're hilarious. Um, basically, you have a bunch of lines, it's a psychology experiment, you have a line of people, and you say, like, which line does this one match in length? And there's only one test subject, everybody else is in on the game, they all say the wrong one, right. to see if that guy will say the wrong one just to fit in. And a lot of the time, he'll say something that's obviously untrue to fit in. Right now, that's what we have with government. If people hear government, government, yeah, it's good, yeah, vote, yeah, democracy, yeah, government, yeah, authority, yeah, obey the law, yeah, pay your taxes. And then they hear five people saying, no, that's bogus and illegitimate. The comfort of cleaning that lie without even looking at it suddenly goes away. And the more they hear it from the more places, it's suddenly like, maybe I have to think about this. And the people in power know it. They know that when they start to lose control of the minds, like, if I was in power and knew how many anarchists there are in the Marines right now <laughs> that I know personally, I would not feel comfortable. A lot of soldiers who are still active duty are figuring this out. Wow, yeah. this isn't you know, this isn't legitimate. And they talk to other ones. And suddenly, when you hear an opposing opinion, then you're able to think about it. If all you ever hear is authoritarian garbage, you're not even going to know there is another thing to think. But it's spreading everywhere, and it's you know there's that ten percent tipping point. When ten percent of people understand this, it's going to be everybody. And we're not at 10%, but we're roaring in that direction. And just to get the idea in front of people who've never thought about it before. And that was true of me for most of my life. I just never, you know, I didn't think there was somebody in favor of smaller government than me. So all I ever argued about was those big collectivists who want government doing everything. And somebody says, well, why do you want it doing this much? Uh, I don't know. I've never had to defend that before. Mike the Minarchist. Right. Mike the Minarchist. <laughs> the surgeon. You're right. And then take away 80%, it's all good. All right. Okay, so remove 80%, and we're done. <laughs> Don't worry about the rest. You just want minimal cancer. Um, so if people don't hear the idea, they don't think about it. In the vast majority of cases, people are hearing the idea all over the place. And there are... I don't dare to say names. There are some people who are known as Minarchists in the mainstream media who aren't... They just don't dare to say they're anarchists because they would get fired in a heartbeat. But the ideas are all over there. And Ron Paul is almost one. Even he uses the term voluntarist um, on a regular basis. Um, just don't bring up his son, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's not his son. Bring up my lunch. He was Questions adopted. The back, <laughs> been waiting to oh, he's going to change the system. Oh. They are in the process of closing their private property. Um, so I don't know what to there do. There is an either. after party at the Crown Anchor, which is around the corner. So it's so like Trump. Trump. South on Maryland. Left on Trump. It's uh, less than a mile from here, so you can continue if you have more questions. Yeah. You, know, you, you have time for one more question. You've been waiting in the back for a while. Okay. So, in an average society, let's say, like you just talked about land, for example, there's lots of land. I find myself a modest parcel of land, and I see a few trees, build myself a little home for my family and someone else decides to forcibly take it away from me. What recourse do I have? I'm small, I'm not gonna shoot them, and that would be just as long as what they did. Do I just move somewhere else and keep moving and moving? Call me. Hire me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it for a case of beer. <laughs> I know thousands and thousands of people who would be perfectly happy to be the first pe person to show up to defend your land. And that's the thing is, we have a, uh, a, a, a society that understands self-ownership, we understand we aren't free unless we're all free, and if one of us is attacked, we should go help them. You know, we don't, it's not okay to coerce somebody to go protect somebody else, but people naturally do that if they see somebody else aggressed against. But if they're coming in your house, yeah. They're acting what right do you have? Or does anyone else have to do that to help me? Why do I have more? Why am I better than this person? Because it's just because it's your property. Why do I deserve to be there? Because they're first. Yeah, because you build the, 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 the house because yeah. it's your property. That, that's that's what just comes down to property rights because you built the house there. And that's by building it, it became yours. Your effort or paying somebody else or you know however you got it by voluntary means. It's yours. They don't have the same claim to it that you do, and so they're the aggressor. 
and people who want a society without aggression would say that's exactly what we have to stop. And usually just the ability to fend off such people works. Because if somebody was saying, hey, I'm going to go take her house, and 100 people said, you're not going to like the outcome. If you plan on living in that house after you forcibly kick her out, bad things are going to happen to you. Even a nasty person is going to go, okay, let's not do that because it's not going to work well for me. Um, but yeah, there's nothing, you know, the, the right, the inherent right of, of defense, self-defense and defending others. I usually, you know, the shorthand is self-defense. We have the right to defend anybody from an aggressor and people can band together and cooperate and have every reason to do that rather than every person thinking it's up to them. Just like every person doesn't think it's up to them to have to feed themselves. We have really complicated interactions that we can voluntarily, you know, you grow the food, you sell it, chips it over here and everything else. You do the same thing with protection and everything else that you have somebody to call if somebody's attacking and organize and cooperate in a million different voluntary ways and the distinction that matters is the aggressor and the victim. In that case, it's your house, it's your property, the guy coming in to kick you out is the aggressor. The aggressor loses his rights the minute he violates the individual yeah. rights of another. Yeah, when an aggressor violates somebody's rights, his rights are not going Like, you don't get to not have force. What? Thank you. Sorry to touch.